Welcome to the Control Engineering webcast, How to Turn Serv Tune Servo Systems, Part 1, sponsored by Aerotech. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with the audio or slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, Type a message in the Ask a Question box, and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for the speaker today in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents also will be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. We will now hear from the sponsor of today's webcast, Aerotech. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. Now I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Dr. Joseph Perfetta has more than 30 years of experience in technology-driven companies. He is the director of the Control Systems Group at Aerotech with P&L responsibility for controls, drives, and motors. In this role, he works with companies to design and select control system architectures that result in increased machine performance while minimizing component cost. He has earned a Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and PhD, and Executive MBA. He has been awarded five patents and published 43 papers. Dr. Perfetta is also an adjunct professor in the Technical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, where he teaches software engineering. Joseph, thank you for joining us, and please go ahead. Uh, Mark, uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, before we begin, I thought let's just take a quick look at what is likely most of our uh, most of us had experiences when we sit down at the machine to tune. 
So I'm sure that most of us had had that experience where we sit down, uh, we need to commission a machine to get it out the door and ship it, and uh, the first thing we try ends up really not being very successful. So let's just review uh, in this uh, seminar some ideas on how to use frequency domain to also tune as opposed to just time domain. Before we start that though, let's just review the general problem, right? So we have a a system that we need to somehow stabilize and what's shown in the picture here is you see a representation in the frequency domain. We have a plant that we model as a transfer function GP of S with an output Y of S and we would like to control that output to move in a direction or to a position if we're doing positioning control that we would like. We measure that Y of S through some sensor and we represent that as a feedback uh, through a transfer function H of S, we take that feedback signal, we subtract it from the desired signal that we would like and generate an error signal. That error signal then acted on by our controller or the control law that produces an actuating signal into the plant. And the idea is if, that we, have, if we have a good controller and it's stabilized well, our output Y will track the desired input Y of D. We often do this in the time domain, but we can also use the frequency domain for this. Why do we need the closed loop system at all? Just We have systems that uh, have disturbances in them. We have friction, we have mass imbalance, there's noise in the sensors and transducers. We have also the problem that we don't really know the plant. We have a, an idea of what the plant looks like, but the exact parameters are unknown. And as you move the system around, it's say travel, if you have a positioning system again, uh, the plant will somewhat change. And so due to these reasons, we need to have a feedback that compensates for these types of disturbances and unknown values that the plant has. So we're familiar with a standard PID controller, and you see in the upper right-hand corner Again, we have our plant, uh, GP of S, producing an output Y. We have our feedback. I just assume a unity gain here. And then we have our air signal that's acted on by a proportional gain, by an integral control, which is KI over S, and the derivative gain, which is KD times S. In the frequency domain, we think about the Laplace variable S, and this is uh, a differentiator when we have a multiplication by s and an integrator when we have one over s. And so this is our control law PID. And most of us would be familiar with how the different gains react as you increase them or decrease them. In this particular case, if we just look at the left hand side of the screen, we see increasing KP holding KI and KD. Uh, static. We see the increase in oscillation of the system response. We see a better rise time in the system, and we see some small change in the steady state error. It decreases, but it does not go to zero. Then if we look at the middle, and we just change Ki and increase it, hold the other two gains constant, what happens is we see, again, a decrease in the rise time, we see an increase in the overshoot, but we can totally eliminate the steady state error with the integral gain. We also increase the settling time a bit. Then looking at KD, holding the other two gains constant will increase the rise time as we increase KD, will decrease the overshoot a bit, it will decrease the settle time, but will have no effect on the steady state error. So we typically would sit down and have KI and KD be zero, we'll put in some value for KP to try to stabilize the system, and then we'll begin increasing the gains, both KP and KI, and then finally probably trim the KD a little bit. Would be a, a fairly standard operation in that. Now, the problem with the time domain is we don't really have any understanding of the character of the resonance structure that we're trying to control, and therefore what we tend to do is put a low-pass filter in it's some arbitrarily low frequency to knock down the resonant peaks that are in the system, that are vibrating the system, like we saw in the beginning video. If we 
use the frequency domain, we can have a little bit more information and using both frequency and time domain tuning, increase the performance of our system. So let's just look at some frequency response tools. The plant is shown here, G of S. We have the output Y and we have an input uh, YD. So what we do is to subject the plant to a sinusoidal signal and the output of a linear system will be also sinusoidal. It will have the same frequency, but it will have a different magnitude and phase of the input signal. And what we do is we measure that magnitude and phase difference at many discrete frequencies and we create ourselves a logarithmic plot. Uh, we call that a Bode plot. And with the, the Bode plot of the input and output system, depending upon which inputs and outputs we select, we can learn something about the system. Uh, another frequency response tool we often use are FFTs. So don't confuse FFTs with Bode plots. FFTs, we take a time signal and we look at the frequency content. Here what we're doing is studying the steady state response of a system to a series of sinusoids put in at different frequencies and plotting their magnitude and phase. So just to take a look at the definition a little bit more uh, detailed, here is a system on the right on the bottom. It has a magnitude and phase plot. The magnitude is in this blue line here, and the phase is in the red line here. If you focus on this point here at 20 hertz, and I put a sinusoid into the system at 20 hertz, that's what's shown up here in the upper left. You see the, the cyan input sinusoid is the input to the system, and the purple is the output of the system. And what you notice is when you look at the output, it's a larger amplitude than that of the input, and it's a little bit delayed, so it has a little bit of phase lag. If I would look at the Bode plot here, what I'll notice at 20 hertz is that there's about 2.1 dB uh, measured on the magnitude curve, which tells us that it is larger, in fact. And if I look at the phase, which is down here, I see that I have about minus 7.7 .7 degrees of phase lag. So this matches exactly what we see in the plot above. We could repeat the same process by looking, say, at this line at 70 hertz. And what we see is that the input signal is, again, shown here, but the output signal is much smaller in the purple. And that's, if we look at the magnitude plot, we'd expect that because we're at something like maybe minus 10 dB here. And we also look and see that the phase or the delay in the output sinusoid is much larger than at 20 hertz. Again, we would expect that looking at the plot because our phase delay is much larger. So. Again, just a sequence or a series of sinusoids put in at different frequencies, plotted both the magnitude and phase output relative to the input. This is what we call Bode plot. Now, next thing we need to have is some idea of the plant that we're trying to control or the system model. Here's a typical X, Y, Z stack. So we have the, the X axis, the Y axis, the Z axis, and then we have two rotaries up on top. Likely our work point is at the top of this rotary here where we're working on some piece or a process. And we're applying actuation signal to each of these axes. So if I think of this system as a set of masses connected by springs and dampers, then I could create a model of the system. Now, the five masses I have shown here is not nearly enough to, to model the, the, six, the five axes that we have here. But we would have many more masses that are connected by springs and dampers, and there would be some movement of each of these masses as I stimulate the system with uh, a current into each of the motors. It's hard to think about what the response of a many mass system is, and so the typical thing that we will do is just think about a two mass model where I have one mass that is represented here by M1. I apply a force to that mass, and then I measure the position of that mass. And then I have a second mass here that is connected to mass one through a spring and a damper, and I can measure 
the position of mass two. We call that X two. Most of the time in the control system, what we're doing is we're applying a force, we're measuring the position of mass one, and we're closing the loop on that position measurement. And mass two is just kind of moving around here uh, without any control. And so the task at hand is, well, how do I really control the position of mass two with a measurement on mass one and the force applied to mass one? So this model is a very nice representation of the system that we can keep in our head as we tune sitting at the machine. The transfer functions for this two mass system are shown below. And one thing that you do notice is in the denominator here, this is called the characteristic equation, it's the same in both the transfer functions where I look at what is the resulting motion of the position of mass one and the position of mass two relative to this force input. It doesn't matter which inputs and outputs you look at, the characteristic equation of the system will always be the same. The zeros will be different, and you can see that by looking at this polynomial in the numerator here that the zeros of the system are different depending upon where you look at the output relative to that same force input. And so when we design the system we're, with a closed loop controller, we're basically moving these zeros to try to stabilize the system properly. Now, just to keep in our head, what are the responses of a second order system there are two relevant parameters that we should be interested in. The first is the bandwidth, we call that omega b. The second is the damping, we call that xi. Some people like to call it zeta. And if we look at the plots here on the left, uh, these are the, the magnitude curves. And so this one in the upper left here. So looking at the transfer function here, h of s, which is omega b divided by the polynomial s squared plus two xi omega b plus omega b squared. And consider what happens as I increase omega b. Well, we see a family of curves here that starting with the lowest omega b gives you a bandwidth of about one radian per second. And as I increase that omega b, I see the bandwidth of the system increase out to I think about four radians per second on the, the last curve. And if I look at the plot below that, I see the phase, and I can see that the phase margin, or the phase of the system, or the phase loss of the system as the bandwidth increases, omega b also lessens. Just to correlate that to what the time domain looks like, if I take that same system and I do a step response, and the time domain equation for the equivalent step response is written here, increasing omega b gives me this move in family of curves where my rise time drastically decreases, which is good, uh, but my overshoot stays the same. And so the thing to think about when I'm thinking about the second order system is I increase bandwidth, I decrease rise time, I keep the overshoot the same, that's usually increasing the performance of the machine. The second parameter we need to think about, the damping or, or xi. Looking at the right here, I have a family of curves which show a decreasing xi, and with the largest psi, which is set to one here, I see a, a system that has very little peaking in, in the uh, magnitude response. But as I decrease the psi and I get to, and I believe the last one is set at 0.1, I have a very tall peak in, in the response of the system. If I look at the phase as I decrease the psi, Again, I see that as I decrease psi, the phase transition occurs much more sharply and uh, at the specific center frequency of this resonance peak. And then just correlating that to the time domain, as I decrease psi, what I see is an increase in the amount of oscillatory response that I get to a step in the system. Where I get to psi is equal to zero, I just have a pure oscillator, which is shown in this blue curve, right? So if I just touch the system a little bit and ping it, I'm going to oscillate forever. Okay, just to make sure we have a good intuitive feel for what it means when I have a system with a low damping, which gives us 
this peak here, and I, I have a resonance structure, uh, I just remind you of something you've probably seen before, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. If you listen to the video of the bridge, you can pull out a couple parameters and you can draw for yourself a frequency response. And what you see is a frequency response that looks like this with that peaking, with that xi. And as we all know, what happened was the wind was hitting the bridge at just the right frequency to excite that resonance and it tore itself apart. So when we design our mechanical systems, we usually try to avoid this. And when we do have it, which does occur, we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we deal with it? And how do we set the control system to help deal with these types of resonance structures? Well, we do it this way. We take a look at our system here. I have a controller GC and I have a plant GP or G plant of S. And I measure the loop transmission of the system or sometimes referred to as the loop gain. This loop gain is shown by this little yellow tracer that's moving from the summing junction through GC of S, through G, G plant of S, and around the feedback. So it's the gain around that loop, which is different from the closed loop response, which is a measurement shown in the red arrow from the output Y of S to the input YD of S. The overall closed loop system will tell us what the ultimate time response will be in true a step in terms of rise time and overshoot and that but it's the loop transmission or the loop gain that tells us the stability of the system and it's the stability that we're interested in assessing first so that we can pick appropriate gains for the system the loop transmission or the loop gain is shown by this uh, equation here the loop gain is just gc times gp in in this system now let's look at a more detailed structure so here what i've shown is on the far right a rigid body plant which is just the one over ms squared these two blocks put together and I have a power amplifier, and I can put a current command into that power amplifier. So typically, many controllers will measure the loop gain by inserting a current, as you see here. So a current comes in, moves around the loop, we measure that, we have the feedback, we generate an air signal, and then it goes it go through the controller, the proportional integral and derivative gains. This PID structure is a little different than the first one I showed. It's an equivalent PID structure, but it also has two loops. I measure the output here, Y of S, as a position, and I then differentiate that and use that as a velocity feedback. And I also use the measurement of the position as a position feedback. So I have a velocity loop here, and I have a position loop here. Notice that the loop gain does it not include this feed forward signal? And this is why I say that measuring the transfer function, the closed loop transfer function from Y of S to Y of D is a different response than this loop gain. Loop gains for stability, the overall response that you have to an input Y of S includes also this feed forward, which is not being measured here. Some control systems, if you when you get them, they will measure the, the loop gain from YD to YS, and they'll turn off the feed forward system signal in the system and measure it that way. Many times the current is the, the better way to measure the system just because of the scaling of the system. You can stimulate the system with a little bit larger signal and measure the loop gain in a little bit better way. It's not necessary to measure the frequency response only with swept sign methods. There are other methods. One other method is to stimulate the system with white noise and then measure what the response is to that white noise input. The, the good thing about using white noise, it stimulates all frequencies. And so if you're trying to understand what the character of the resonance is, stimulation with white noise will give you the advantage that you'll not miss any of the peaks. You may have a better idea of how wide the resonance structure is. 
as opposed to picking a discrete number of sinusoids, you might miss a little bit of information there. Uh, of course, you can always rerun the response with higher density sinusoids uh, and get a better understanding of what the, the frequency response looks like. But using these two complementary techniques is often helpful. Okay, now we have a loop transmission and we can measure stability. The way we measure stability is by looking at the gain and the phase margin. And the way we measure these is up on top I have a loop gain or loop transmission, which is the magnitude, and below that I have the phase. And if I look at the crossover of the phase on the minus 180 degree line, which is right here, and look at that same frequency on the gain, I measure the difference between the zero dB line, which is uh, unity, and the gain curve here. And that distance is my gain margin. If I look at the phase margin in the system, what I'm asking is, if I look at the crossover of the zero dB line of the magnitude curve, and then look at what is the phase difference between 180, minus 180 degrees and the phase curve here. That distance there is my phase margin. Now, from a theoretical standpoint, as long as I have some very small amount of gain margin and small amount of phase margin, I have a stable system. But in the practical sense, the system will have some disturbances. We don't clearly know the whole plant. If I just move the stage over uh, 100 millimeters, I may have a little bit different response in the system. And so what we need to do is create a robust controller. And so the typical values that we would look at is having a gain margin of greater than 6 dB and a phase margin of greater than 30 degrees. And if you can achieve that, typically you can move the systems through its travel you can have some disturbances, you can have maybe a little bit of mass uh, change, and you won't result in an unstable system. Okay, so now that we know what a loop transmission looks like and what its definition is, uh, let's just take a quick look at collecting one. Okay, so that was a typical collection of a loop transmission. We ran a series of sinusoids. You saw the XY stage sitting on your right there. Couldn't really see them move because they're moving only uh, just a few hundred microns in some cases at the highest frequencies and maybe not quite a quarter of a millimeter at the lower frequencies. But you probably did hear them as they move through the, the frequencies uh, on the tones. So with our loop transmission collected, uh, I want to say just a, a quick word about digital controllers because most of the time we're using a digital control system. I've drawn everything and talked about everything in the continuous domain right now. And so how does a digital controller affect the loop transmission or the gains that we pick? The answer is we don't really need to worry about it. We're measuring the actual frequency response of the system. The digital controller is operating Typically, we are measuring a sensor. We're bringing that in through an analog to digital converter. We are then generating some trajectory inside the computer that we need to follow. We're generating a discrete air response or air signal and applying that with a discrete controller. And then we're producing an output through maybe a D to A with a sample on hold. There's other techniques that produces a signal into the plant usually a current and a motor. And then each of these, the D to A's, the A to D, and the plant and the generation of the signal are all timed on a clock so that we are on a 
persistent, maybe millisecond or submillisecond basis, computing the appropriate values and collecting all the inputs and putting out the outputs. Uh, the less jitter on the clock, the better, and usually the faster the clock, known as sample time, the better. But since we measure the frequency response, we're seeing that delay in the system, and that delay just looks like a little bit of phase loss. And so the effects of the digital controller, when I look at this frequency response, is already taken into account. And as I select the gains and shape the frequency response or the loop, I'm, I'm already taking into account this digital control. So when you're sitting in the machine, you don't really have to think about it when you're using this technique. OK, so why do we like the frequency domain? Mainly because it's additive. And using uh, this additive nature is easy to think about how I should shape the loop. So here is, let's say, a loop gain and of a system. And you see that we have a resonance at 5 radians per second by this peak. And what I'd like to do is to add a notch to that. Here's a typical notch filter, a family of notch filters. And you can see that the black notch filter is much narrower than the other notch filters here shown. And you can see the narrower the filter, the more distinct or quick the phase changes. But I also, if I look back here, maybe a decade away from where the center frequency of the notch is, I have less phase loss. And so I'd like to put in as narrow of notch as I can to cover or cancel up the resonance within the control loop itself. Remember, canceling a resonance is only from a stability standpoint. The resonance still exists in the system, and you could excite it, but you at least will be stable in terms of the system. So I want to put in the most narrow notch that I can to compensate the uh, resonance in the system, but I need to put a wide enough one in that I'm going to cover as wide as the resonance in the system is. So. I take this notch filter, I overlay it on top of the plant, and that's shown in green here. And basically, the response of the system will be the additive response of the green notch filter and the red plant on a frequency by frequency basis. So take this green curve here, add it in terms of dB to this red curve, and do that at every frequency point. And that gives you the resulting response. So it's this additive nature of adding, say, filters in the frequency domain to the plant that makes it easy to think about how to loop shape. What's shown here in black is the resulting curve of adding the notch filter. And you can see the corresponding uh, uh, phase. If I look at the resulting response in the black, I see that at about the crossover of the phase at 180 degree, minus 180 degrees here, that I have about 10 dB of gain margin. So I have effectively notched out the resonance and created enough gain margin for myself that instead of leaving the crossover at one radian per second, I could increase the gain of this, overall gain of this system and increase the bandwidth which of course is going to give me faster rise time and increase the performance of the machine. That would look like this. So I increase the gain, and if I look at the effect on the time response to a step, I'll see that I have a uh, decreased uh, rise time, and I get to the final value that I'm looking for much faster. So usually when I sit down to do a stabilization and pick the gains, my goal is to have as high a bandwidth as possible. That's not always the right answer, but it's almost always the right answer. So I'm trying to increase the bandwidth as much as I can and have as little phase loss as I can in the system. Okay, what I've shown you so far are very nice uh, theoretical curves. Uh, let's look at a real loop transmission because they never look that nice. And so here's a loop transmission that was collected. And there's usually some judgments that need to be made. And the first way to make those is you need to evaluate all of the crossovers. What I showed you in 
in the theoretical curves just had one crossover. But if you look at this system here, the phase crosses over minus 180 in several places. I need to check the gain margin in each of those places. And I need to check any place that the gain crosses over. Uh, there's one place in particular that it crosses over here, which is shown right here. But there is another place where the gain gets very close to 0 dB. And so I would just look at that and see how much phase margin there is as well. Because if I move the system over a few millimeters, it could be that this ends up peaking above that. So I, I just take a look at that as well. So with this system here, I would likely want to put a low pass filter in, and I might be concerned about this resonance here. So let's just talk about how to loop shape and what the steps are and what the guidelines are. So I want to take, put in a low pass filter I would like to put that at as low a frequency as possible, but I don't want to put it so low that I have the phase start affecting where the crossover of the loop gain is. I want to put it low enough that I'm going to filter out any sensor noise that I have, but I also want to keep it at a high enough that I'm not giving getting phase loss, as I said, at the crossover. So that's the first thing. Second, I want to put in a notch filter to get rid of any of the resonances, and I put take this notch filter center frequency, and I'll I'll line that up with the uh, center frequency of the resonance structure. So here's a loop transmission. I have a, a crossover right now of about 75 hertz. I see a clear resonance here that is going to cause me a problem. I'm touching the 0 dB line, and so I don't have enough uh, phase margin to allow the system to operate. So the first thing that we do is, after getting the response, we identify really where is the, the maximum phase point, and that really is at the residence. I can't cross the system over here, so then I look at the next one, next most largest phase, which is really down at DC. If I cross over at DC, I really have a very sluggish system, and so I'm forced to then just keep pushing out, pushing out, until I get to a point where uh, this is about as large of a gain I can put into the gain system, uh, and I'm just marginally stable here. So now what I want to do is put a, a notch filter in here in the system, and I'll do that by uh, picking the appropriate KI and, and K pause. That's what I did to increase the gain. And then I want to take and put a notch filter in. So if I take and add a notch into that, I'll knock on that resonant peak. And that's shown here in the little red circle. And you can see I have plenty of gain margin compared to previous without the notch that I most likely can increase the gain again. But before I do that, I want to knock down this higher frequency kind of noise I see, and I'll take and put a low-pass filter in for that. Typically, I'll put the low-pass filter somewhere between, for let's say mechanical systems like you saw in the screen that we did the loop transmission of, uh, between 400 and 2 kilohertz. That's, that's a good rule of thumb. You'd also, if you can, like to keep the notch or the low pass filter uh, 10 times the frequency of the crossover. And that's because if you look at the phase loss of a low pass filter at one decade before, 10 times before, you'll see that it's almost zero. And so you're giving yourself a system that has as little phase loss due to the addition of this low pass filter as possible. With that low pass filter added and the notch, as I said, we can now take an increase KP or K pause in that equivalent PID structure and increase the crossover of the loop gain to 100 hertz. I have sufficient phase margin here. And if I look at the crossovers of the minus 180 on the phase curve, I have sufficient gain margin here. So now I have a stable system with a higher bandwidth which means that I'll have a faster response time to the input of the system, which increases machine, machine throughput. 
Now, we want to go back to the time domain now. We, we've loop shaped the system and we want to do some step responses and see how the system responds or maybe if we're doing contouring we would put in the contoured move and see how the system tracks and we would repeat this as necessary. If I don't quite meet the specs of the machine, I go back and look at the loop transmission and see how it could affect that. So for instance, if I was not meeting the steady state error, I'd be tempted to go back and try to raise the low frequency gain of the system. And that would, that would help me uh, pull in a little bit faster on a step response. One last little note as you're loop shaping, uh, before you begin, and I've, I've made this mistake several times, and I'm sure a few of us have, uh, don't forget to tighten all the bolts. Look down at the uh, feet and make sure they're secure. Look at the payload, make sure that it's tightened up. Uh, if you don't have the bolts tightened when you do a frequency response, what you'll see is a movement of the system that it looks like a resonance, but doesn't have the phase movements. It's a mass uh, it, the mass gets disconnected from the, the system, and uh, it's very hard to stabilize those. So the first thing to do is usually make sure all the bolts are tight. Okay, so now that we've seen that, let's take a look at uh, loop shaping the system that we took the frequency response or loop gain of earlier. Here we have a frequency response of a linear motor axis and the first thing that we notice is there are some resonances here. We can see three dominant resonances. <clears throat> and if we look at the gain and phase margins of these, so on the cursor here, here's the gain curve, here's the phase curve. At the zero crossing of the gain curve we can see that the phase margin is 55 degrees and so that doesn't pose us any real issues. If we look at some of the other gain crossings, they also don't pose us any issues. And then we have the phase crossing out here, and we see that uh, we don't really have a instability noted. So one would think if we would just turn on the system from looking at all the gain and phase, that probably it sits there stable. However, we know that with these resonance poking above the zero dB line, any slight disturbance is going to cause the system to go unstable. Okay, so now that we verified the system's unstable, let's go and put some filters in to remedy that problem. Now, if I were tuning in the time domain and didn't really have this characterization of the system in front of me, what I would need to do is just put a low pass filter in. So let me add a low pass filter. And I'd have to pick some arbitrarily low frequency to set the filter at to dampen all of these resonances and any noise that comes from the sensor above. And if I do that, I can see I still have an unstable system here in terms of gain margin. So I I probably need to lower that a little bit and if I look at this at the crossover I have uh, about seven degrees of phase margin still not quite enough and so maybe I would have to lower this a bit more or the other option is I could lower the gain and uh, retrieve a little bit more in terms of gain and phase margin. Now let's take advantage of the fact we have a loop gain frequency response and we can see the character of the resonances. First step, as we said before, is we should take and put in a low pass filter. We'll take that low pass filter and position it at about 450 hertz. That will attenuate this resonance out here. Uh, we see that we still have a problem with this resonance, so our next step will be to take and add a notch filter over top of that. The frequency of this
looks to be about 310 or so hertz so we'll put one at 316 we have a width of 130 that we'll pick and a depth of oh let's say about 20 and we can see that does drop this peak down underneath of the 0 dB line on the filter and we can play with the depth and the width of the filter to try to make it optimal looks like I need to have a little bit more width and maybe uh, let's move the frequency out just slightly okay so now we have moved this down off of the 0 dB line if I look at my gain margin I have 6.9 dB of gain margin 28 degrees of phase margin so this is indeed a stable system I can take and accept these filters into the system some tools allow you to do an auto fit so you could have just taken and let it auto fit the filters and added those in uh, if you would have would have liked and also some will allow you to let's add another notch filter here and some will allow you just to grab the curve and pull it down and it will back calculate the filters for you and so we could take and accept that and now we've added in the appropriate notch filters to stabilize a system and with the gain and phase margin this is robust as one last note you might try to raise the gain a little bit but you notice that we lose our robustness and so that's probably not a wise choice and then finally let's just check the crossover we can see that we're at 100 Hertz crossover so by being able to see the character of the system the residences specifically and where the crossover is we're able to get a, a bandwidth or a open loop crossover of 100 hertz and comparing that to what we were able to do in the time domain if we were only putting a low pass filter in we achieved about 70 hertz so we've been able to increase the performance of this machine by loop shaping in the frequency domain as opposed to what we likely would have done in the time domain one last note, you see a resonance here, and I've kind of ignored it. Uh, you see the phase move because of that. And that's because if I do look at the crossovers, I have sufficient gain, a phase margin at each of these crossovers here. 26 and here 91. And if I look at the, the closest uh, we come to that 180, I have sufficient gain margin and if I look at each of these crossovers and in fact you can just pull up and look at all the results you'll see that yeah everywhere I have sufficient gain and phase margin so this is how you tune in the frequency domain to increase the performance of the system let's take a look at what the system looks like when it moves now Okay, so now that we've looked at loop shaping a real system, uh, just to summarize, uh, every tool has some limitations and to uh, the goodness that we get out of it. So when looking at loop shaping, it's really meant for single input, single output systems. So we may have to move the system around and look at different responses in different places and take different responses to look at different outputs to get a full view of what the system characterization is like.
Most customers do not give specifications in the frequency domain. They usually specify the throughput of the machine or how fast we need to move or settle. And so you have to kind of infer what the frequency domain care responses would look like or specifications would look like given some time domain specifications. And lastly, one can get carried away when you have the loop transmission, which is to put way too many filters in it. And it's best to put as few filters as possible. Uh, on the good side, right, we have a real measurement of what the uh, robustness of the system is. We can look at the nonlinear effects by measuring different places, and uh, it's pretty easy to use. So if you're a beginner or an expert, really you can loop shape just about as well, especially with some of the tools that you can find in many of the controllers. And finally, what our real goal is, is we can improve performance by adding frequency domain tuning to our time domain tuning of the system. There are other topics that we certainly could discuss in terms of tuning. I uh, plan to do a part two tuning webinar and we'll look at what do I do with process sensitivity or movements in the plant that we don't knew, know? How do I do feed forward tuning to get a, a much better uh, step response? And how do I deal with nonlinearities? Well, thank you, Joseph. We have time for some questions. The audience may type questions for the presenter in the Ask a Question box on the screen, and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we don't get to today will be posted online at controlenge.com with the archived version of this webcast. Reminder, to do download the Certificate of Completion or a copy of the presentation, use the Event Re Resources tab on the left side of your screen. And now uh, to the questions. Um, how do I estimate values for manual tuning? Yeah, so that's a very good question. If you look at the videos that we showed, we kind of skipped that part and already had a little bit of a stable system to take the measurement response. So the first thing you need to do is get at least a stable system so that you can take the measurements. There are some tools that allow you to do a little open loop tuning and they do a little ping on the system. And really what they're doing is measuring the mass of the system to try to get a mass line. So if you can look at your system and estimate what the mass is, then what you can do is on pencil and paper make some estimates of the gains and put them in. The practical problem with that is most controllers don't tell you all the scale factors that they have, but if you knew all the scale factors, you could on pencil and paper make an estimate. Really the best thing to do is think about that two mass model that it model you have that we talked about and at low frequencies it acts like a rigid body and therefore you know that if I put some arbitrarily low proportional gain in with KI and KP set to zero you usually can at least create a stable system and then increase the KP slowly until I can get something that has at least enough of a response to take some measurements and then you can do a loop transmission you can get the gain plot and then you can begin shaping like we did so it's a very good question because you always have to start somewhere or something stable to take some real measurements thank you uh, dealing with um, multiple loops of PID controllers I and mean, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that yeah, thank you. And it looked like actually there was maybe four or five questions on that same topic at a different way, so we'll kind of cover them all here. But basically, if you looked at the control structure we had, we had a measurement on the position, and we used that also to create a, a velocity feedback signal. So there's a couple ways you could do that, depending upon the tools you have. The tool that I showed you really allows you to just paint the loop gain and then loop shape, and you don't really need to worry about the fact that you have different loops. In this case, only because you have a single sensor producing both of those feedback signals. However, in the event that you have multiple sensors that are producing the feedback signals, and you have a different one, say, for the velocity loop versus the position loop, then usually the easiest way is to open up the position loop and do the same type of loop shaping on the velocity loop that you do, that I showed you. And then once you have the highest, the highest bandwidth response that you can get in the velocity loop, then close the position loop and repeat the process. Sometimes there's a loop around the position loop. We do that often for force control. And you would, again, with a closed position loop, tune the, the force loop control. Great, thank you. Um, 
Next, we have a question about notch and low pass filtering, uh, sample time considerations, and considerations for hardware communication. Yeah, so when, when I think about sample time, uh, my answer is always uh, smaller sample time is better. And when we have put in notch and low pass filters, really just to kind of sum up what we said before. Use as few of them as possible. You want to take the low pass filter to knock down the, the sensor noise and maybe some high uh, resonance structures. And then you want to have that as ideally 10 times larger than the crossover of that, of that loop gain. And the notch filters, use as narrow a notch filter as you can and place them at the center frequency of the resonance. And again, use as few of them as you can. How do you remove low-level frequency disturbances? So there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, within the context of what we talked about here, really the best thing to do is to try to increase the low frequency gain. So you can low, and, and one, there's two ways to do that. One is to raise the overall gain curve, and that will give you uh, lower frequency gain. The more gain you have at low frequencies, uh, the better you will mitigate those low frequency disturbances will also help you settle faster and get rid of the steady state error that you might have, uh, freight things like friction. Uh, however, if that doesn't do well enough, you can always trade, usually, you can usually trade gain for phase. And so you can rotate the, uh, the phase curve and uh, also that will help increase the low frequency gain. So you'll typically have to lower the bandwidth of the system a little bit, but if you're really trying to, um, say, pull in to position a little faster, that might be more in your interest uh, with the specifications of the machine that you have. Could you talk about setting up non-aerotech motors? Yeah, sure. So uh, in this particular system, uh, what you would do is You'd look at the uh, motor specs, and what you would have, need from that are the resistance and the inductance. Uh, there's a small tool in the Aerotech tool set that allows you to enter those, and then you can take and pick the appropriate bandwidth and uh, phase margin that you would like, and it will compensate the current loop for you. We didn't talk about the current loop here, uh, but that is the most inner loop that you usually have to compensate but it's really just dependent upon the electrical properties, the R and the L of the motor. And you can set that with a simple proportional integral control. And then from there, it's really tuning just as we have gone through in the seminar. Uh, perhaps one more question. For integrated XY and vertical Z stage tuning issues, how do you get to the same tuning performance from different systems? So, uh, the question I was, I'm a little unclear on, if we take and talk about the same performance out of different systems, I could interpret that as, how do I get the same bandwidth on, say, an XYZ system so that when I do a step response on each one, they all look the same? And there's your answer. You really have to do the loop gain shaping to get them the similar bandwidth. Uh, that helps, but you still will have some influence from the other uh, character of how much low frequency gain do you have in each of them. Uh, you're going to have more mass on the bottom axis than you do on the top axis, and so you're maybe unnecessarily losing a little bit of performance on the top axes that you wouldn't like to have. Great. Thanks so much, uh, everyone, for the great questions. Uh, we'll try to get to the ones that we didn't answer to uh, offline and uh, post that with the webcast uh, archive. Thanks again to Joseph for sharing his time and expertise and, and the videos in today's presentation. Um, also, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, uh, Aerotech, for today's event. And now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on the screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of Control Engineering and Aerotech, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you, and goodbye.